Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fourth episode of the Open Education Cafe. Um, we are happy uh, to have some of our uh, champions in the room, Open Education champions. Some of you might know them through their interviews. Um, uh, we performed some interviews with these great practitioners and uh, uh, champions, actually, about Open Education last year. And I'm going to share the link with all of you in the chat very soon. And you will find them also in the description of the recording when we share the, this recording in our uh, European Network of Open Education Librarians channel on YouTube. NOL for Open is the name. Um, I'm happy today to welcome four great people in the room with me. Uh, let me read their name and their affiliation. Hopefully, I will make no mistakes on that. We have Catherine Cronin from Ireland. She's an independent open scholar. Thank you for being with us, Catherine. We have Shironika Karunana Yaka. I hope that I did better than before. Uh, she's a senior professor in educational technology in the Open University of Sri Lanka. Welcome, Shironika. Happy to have you with us. We have uh, Christine Ranzi, who is Associate Professor in Education from University of Leeds in the UK, and Kamil Szlivowski, uh, blogger and trainer from Poland. Uh, I'm very happy to have you all. And um, uh, what we are doing today is to um, discuss together with our champions um, a little about Action Area 3 in the UNESCO year recommendation. Um, Mm, we are going to, to have um, a discussion around uh, um, some of the uh, specificities of this uh, recommend action area. And I would love to read uh, the first part of the description of it, just to remind all, all of us in the room about uh, uh, the context and the content, the specific content and keywords that uh, um, UNESCO added to the recommendation in relation to encouraging, effective, inclusive, and equitable access to quality OER. Uh, member states are encouraged to support the creation, access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation, and redistribution of inclusive and equitable quality OER for all stakeholders. These would include those learners in formal and non-formal education context, irrespective of inter alia, age, gender, physical ability, and socioeconomic status, as well as those in vulnerable situations, indigenous peoples, those in remote rural areas, including nomadic populations, people residing in, in areas affected by conflicts and natural disasters, ethnic minorities, migrants, refugees, and displaced persons. In all instances, gender equality should be ensured and particular attention paid to equity and inclusion for learners who are especially disadvantaged due to mu multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. So uh, there are also some other uh, specific um, uh, sentences that follow this uh, initial big statement, uh, but uh, uh, you, I've, I will share the link also to the version of the UNESCO OER uh, recommendation that is open to comments and to suggestions from the community uh, soon in the chat, but I would love now to leave the floor to our guests. Uh, so I would love you to open your microphone one by one. Maybe starting with the, uh, the left side of my screen, I see Chrissy as the first one um, to introduce yourself and uh, briefly tell us um, what you're working on, what are you working on now, and uh, particularly in relation to this uh, action area of the UNESCO year recommendation. And I would love all of you to answer this question at the beginning. Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you, and uh, Vanessa also, and Spark, for this uh, kind invitation. I'm looking forward to the discussion um, with everybody here on the panel and uh, colleagues who have joined us from different parts of the world. As Paula said already, uh, I work in the School of Education, uh, where I contribute to the MA in Digital Education at the University of Leeds, but I'm also a senior lead on a very ambitious and new 
fresh uh, initiative that uh, the university just uh, started um, with a sponsor, our very own uh, pro um, VC, Professor Simone Beitendeck, uh, and the lead of this uh, project is uh, Professor Nick Plant. Uh, I'm talking about the Knowledge Equity Network, with, uh, which has the ambition to bring together open education, uh, open research, to uh, make a difference to this world through so radical collaboration, as uh, Simone, our VC, uh, has said her herself many, many times. So the ambition is to work together with institutions, with publishers, with other organizations, with open uh, educators and practitioners, champions, rebels, if you like, uh, to make a difference uh, to this work through collaboration. And I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, what about you, Catherine? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever people are. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Paula and Vanessa and the network and everyone who's here. Uh, and just so um, honored to be on such an esteemed panel. So thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, Paula, I'm an independent open scholar. Uh, I worked in Irish higher education for many years and also in community education in Ireland and other countries. Um, but for the past year, I've been doing my research and writing and other work um, just in, in, from an independent um, position. Uh, one big piece of that work was a GoGN fellowship, which I completed last year, in which um, I had been working in the area of open education within higher education for several years, and I um, chose on my fellowship to work with community partners to help them to better understand and support their open knowledge practices. Um, so the project was called Just Knowledge rather than Open Knowledge, and it was informed by the practices of intersectional data feminism um, from the book uh, by the same name, Data Feminism. And I think these are just phenomenal principles. It's a set of seven principles, you know, for any work in open education or open data um, and was it was really productive um, and generative in working with the community partners. Um, but I suppose my main work in the last 18 months has been um, co-editing with um, my friend and colleague, Laura Chernewich, a book called Higher Education for Good, which will be openly published. Uh, we're hoping about the middle of this year, uh, possibly this summertime. Um, uh, the book is called Higher Education for Good, Teaching and Learning Futures. And it acknowledges the you know, severe and overlapping crises in higher education globally. Um, and uh, about um, 70 different authors in 27 chapters offer really diverse ways of um, conceptualizing and creating higher education futures that foreground the kinds of things we're talking about today. So inclusion, equity, social justice, care, sustainability, um, and so on. So we're really excited about that. I, I'll put a link in. Um, so you can find out more about the book and um, and I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Looking forward to, to, to this book also. <laughs> uh, Camille, I would leave the floor to you. You're next in my screen. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the invitation. So very briefly, uh, I was working with Creative Commons Poland and Creative Commons globally for um, at least 10 years. And uh, this is the base of my work. So I do a lot of trainings. I'm a li librarian by studies, but uh, never worked that much in library. Uh, but most of my work was training teachers, librarians, helping them how to implement both uh, new solutions, how to use open education, open education resources, or copyright in a bigger scope. Uh, and also supporting uh, ICT implementations in libraries and in library practice. And I think why I'm here for the last five years, I support a project called SPOWET, difficult to translate uh, to other languages. It's a mix of Polish words. And uh, it's uh, kind of like a community cohort of teachers and practitioners who are building uh, specific uh, very diverse open education resources. So each year we pick a topic and then we kind of gather a cohort of people who want to create bottom-up uh, new set of high quality and diverse and inclusive resources, which very often are missing on the market. And this year we are working with cohort of teachers from Poland and from Ukraine. 
building such resources missing from a formal education that are open education resources uh, for um, teachers working with uh, multi-language classroom and multicultural classrooms. Uh, and we are focusing especially on the situation of Ukrainian students in Poland and both Ukrainian and Polish teachers working uh, working with, with such groups. Wonderful, very interesting project. And also, uh, I would love to know more about uh, the multilingual opportunities of those resources, because uh, it might be that uh, the larger community can contribute uh, to yeah, it, more we hope, we hope so. Yeah. Okay, Sharonika, what about you? <laughs> Let me try to, okay. yeah, okay, right. um, you are yeah. muted now. Thank you, yes, uh, greetings uh, everyone. Hello everyone, uh, I'm uh, from Sri Lanka. Uh, so from the Asian region, uh, though I think we all have same interest and the concern in open education. And thank you very much for inviting me for this session, Paola, especially. You're more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, so as you said, I'm from the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. I've been there since 1993. Uh, but prior to that, I have been a student there as well since 1983. Uh, so I think I, my association with the open and distance learning system runs into almost four decades. Uh, I've been, a, before joining the Open Institute, I've been a school teacher myself. And now I'm at the faculty of, I'm, I've been working at the faculty of education where we mainly work with teachers, school teachers and educators in the uh, I mean, other educators in the field of education, teachers and teacher educators. So most of my um, initi I mean, initiatives in OER and OEP is uh, mainly to promote the adoption of OER and OEP among teachers, both at the university level and at the school level, because I strongly believe that teachers play a significant role uh, in uh, enhancing OER and OEP. Uh, so first we started with, I mean, uh, we started only in 2000, around 2012, 2013. Uh, we started just uh, uh, the Faculty of Education itself because we had to develop our cap capacity first before uh, moving on to teachers. So with a call supported project, we developed our capacities. And uh, then with that, we started integrating OER and OEP into all our teacher education programs. So from our faculty, we moved on to the other faculties through an OER-based e-learning project, which later on developed as a MOOC. I think Paola knows about the MOOC. Uh, yes. Most recently, I've been uh, uh, this, with the school teachers, we've done a big project in the ROF4D project. Uh, you might have heard of it, uh, ROER4D project, where we work with school teachers in all over the country, uh, you know, in uh, all ethnicities, uh, covering all sorts of uh, rural areas. Uh, we have all nine provinces, so working with uh, large group of teachers in the nine provinces. We, it was a great experience uh, in introducing these concepts and uh, allowing them to integrate them in their teaching and learning because it was a totally novel concept. Uh, and we actually, we shared their stories. There were a lot of, I mean, we'll talk later about the issues, I mean, challenges about equity and access. Uh, it was a great experience. And most recently I have been again working with school teachers during 2018, 2020. 22, with the C Delta project of the Commonwealth of Learning, that is Commonwealth Digital Education Leaders uh, Training in Action, where OER is also part of it. Uh, so until 2022, we have been working with school teachers again during the COVID period and with all sorts of challenges. Still, uh, that was also great experience. We have openly shared all these experiences through stories, I we think stories are very powerful ways of showing uh, how uh, they have gone through these uh, journeys of uh, OER and OEP, I mean, OER, um, open education. Uh, so just now, uh, fin after finishing this uh, most recent project, now my team, I mean, they are all teamwork, I should say, even though I've initiated all the very good teams work with me. So just now my current team, we are working on another publication, another book on the C-Delta project. We have just started on that. So I think uh, for the moment that's now. So uh, I believe this sharing of uh, things openly because all these publications, videos we have published through blogs, videos, books, all licensed with the Creative Commons license. 
because at the Open University of Sri Lanka, we have an OER policy. We are the first uh, higher education institution in Sri Lanka to adopt an OER policy. So all these uh, publications related to the initiatives we release with the CCBYSA license. So that's it. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's amazing uh, the, the number of uh, activities, projects, and uh, uh, practices that you ignited. So, um, and I would love to to share. I, I asked uh, to have some links uh, from uh, Shironika, so I'm going to copy and paste all those links in the chat. Okay, so you can explore. All our participants can explore those projects uh, and also uh, something related to the policy. Uh, and while I do that, uh, I would love to ask uh, our guests, uh, um, moving from uh, uh, their, their experience, uh, moving from your experiences, uh, if, um, um, if is DEI at the core, at the heart of open education, do you really believe that uh, what we are doing uh, uh, is... Um, at the core of open education, and uh, if yes, mm, how and why, first of all, but also how do we get it right? How do we do it uh, respectfully and uh, meaningfully? Um, and also how we can ensure equity? And uh, finally, what difference can it make? Um, so I would love to hear from you. And uh, from now on, there is no order. Uh, it's, a, it's an open discussion and everyone is uh, welcome to start or to jump in. Can I say maybe something briefly just sure. to start the conversation maybe uh, and uh, um, introduce um, something that I have heard a lot being talked about in the context of picture books and as Sharonika talked about stories and, and the power of stories. So when, when we talk, for example, about picture books and which picture books are the most successful ones, the most effective ones to engage um, the audience and which is also cross generational, we often talk about windows and mirrors windows and mirrors that the book opens for the reader. So windows as in opportunities, opportunities for all, for anybody uh, to be able to, to, to see these opportunities, to spot them uh, and relate to these also uh, in the way of, of seeing mirrors where we see ourselves uh, actually in the book. So I see parallels between this windows and mirrors and what we are trying to achieve, I think, for an actual um, education. So it's about being open. It's about being open to, I think, diverse ideas, to uh, perspectives uh, that are also very diverse and very different uh, from our own, uh, which is often not an easy thing to do. Um, because we often seem to stick with people who are like us, who, who believe the same things, who have the same values. But I think it's also think the opportunity, a big opportunity, I think, and the need, if we want to solve these bigger problems, to understand where the other people are coming from that are thinking very, very differently from us, and harnessing uh, their diverse views and moving forward together. Thank you, Chrissy. I have to say I love the the metaphor of of mirrors and what mirrors can can be in the situation because like mirrors opens my mind about thinking about representation in everything we we do, and I think representation is extremely important into in implementing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in education. But if, if I can say something, maybe a bit controversial, going back to the question, the main question is that I think going back 10, 15 years ago open education and OER movement already had, I think, those values, but maybe unrecognized in itself. So we, we are thinking in these terms, even without without knowing exactly what we are we are uh, we are talking about. And I think this is a very important moment when we kind of implement the same same language and it's easier to understand and measure. Are we doing right? Are we doing good? Are we are, are we just talking about or are we really implementing something that's making the uh, the educational system more diverse and inclusive. But I think at the same time, one of the problems personally I, I had, and I was working for a few years with a few think tanks doing policy uh, about open education. And what I found very often is that I think the uh, especially the diversity and inclus uh, inclusion part was very strong 
on uh, within the practitioners, within the authors, within the teachers, within the students who are involved. If they were involved, <laughs> that's 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 a, a different question. How often we are really involving students into cooperation and co-creation uh, for them to be exactly mirrored in the uh, in the resources represented. But uh, but when when we shifted and we are doing more and more policy, what I found very often uh, were those values behind diversity, equity, inclusion. When you're doing policy, they are getting lost, and for many reasons, like. Very basic example from Poland. Uh, we were doing policy between three different governments, and change of the governments can really impact a lot, uh, especially the diversity, equity, inclusion part, even though they continue to work on open education policies. So, like, I would say, like, this in my mind is very, very difficult because I would say, like, the values are there, and the woman wants to uh, wants to uh, wants to follow the values as well. But if it wants to succeed on the policy level, it very often has to drop, or sometimes has to drop, parts of those publicly named values and tracking: Are we doing them or not? And this is a case from Poland only. I don't know if you have the same uh, maybe experiences, but this is where I found some kind of a, a division. Uh, between practice and value, uh, it's sometimes with, with the policy. But other than that, I think we, we were we are close to it, and we are learning all the time how to make this better. And I like that we are talking about this. And I would love to, us to talk about how we can uh, like check ourselves: are we doing this or uh, or not? That that would be a goal for me. Thank you, Camille. I, would, I, I can say almost the same about uh, Italy uh, on some points about changing governments and uh, uh, changing policies according to uh, the change of governments and uh, slowing the process down in those cases. But uh, Shironica, I would love to hear from you now. Okay, thank you. Um, you unmuted me, right? Okay. Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay, so yes, uh, I was also thinking about uh, interesting. Uh, this uh, Chris, uh, Chris said about uh, windows and windows. It brought into my mind about the openness in education. You open up, opening up. So, which I believe I've always tried to promote that concept, uh, not just introducing OER and but the concept of openness, uh, the sharing. Uh, I mean, that sort of change, you know, change of mindset. I think that's very important rather than just technically technically uh, accessing OER or just using them. So I, I, it brought, uh, I mean, my, I thought about that. And also about the mirrors, it, uh, I looked at it from a different perspective about the re reflection. When you look at the mirror, you will see your reflections. So the stories I talked about, uh, the powerful stories, they are reflective stories. Uh, because uh, when we, even though we we do projects and we get them in the teachers, I'm I'm talking about the, my experience with the school teachers. Uh, so even though we are a small country, uh, the diversity is there. I mean, in terms of the access, uh, I mean, the resources, the infrastructure, the remote rural areas. So they face a lot of challenges. Uh, in this process. So that's why we thought of capturing their reflective stories. Uh, like, so that's why the mirrors uh, brought into my mind. So these stories, uh, I think you, you would have uh, shared the links now. Uh, if you go through them later on, you will see they have, they show, uh, I mean, they're heartening to, I mean, uh, the most, most important thing is when you work with uh, these participants, you, you feel, you get the feeling of, you know, how they, they are motivated, they, they appreciate, but the challenges they face to move forward. So to our best, we, we have to support, they need a lot of support in many different ways. Uh, not only the physical support, uh, via like, uh, I mean, there are a lot of problems like devices and connectivity. Uh, in remote areas, you just don't, uh, sometimes you just don't get signals, you know, uh, for internet connectivity. Even now I had a problem here as well, even not in a remote area. So we all face such issues, but not only that, the language issue is there. I mean, when we talk about this access and equity, 
because we are uh, like uh, English language is a second language for us. So most of the resources when they are in English, uh, when we are, uh, search and find them, then they face a lot of difficulties. So, but it's heartening to see how they, they, not only the teachers together with the students, how they address them, how they, their efforts to address them, uh, you know, like translating, using Google Translator and helping each other and create translating and when they couldn't find resources, they were motivated to create their own resources in local languages. So I think that's a very, that, that's open educational practices, I believe, Catherine. Uh, so that, that's where we are moving from this OER to OEP, open educational practices. So I believe these practices, change of um, thinking, the mindset changes and changes in practices towards becoming more and more open and sharing and working collaboratively, helping each other. I think those, for me, those are very important. That's what I'm always trying to emphasize and promote through my projects, not, rather than just the technical aspects of uh, OER. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, if you later on, uh, I invite all of you to go through those stories which will show, uh, I mean, then you will uh, really understand uh, what I've been trying to uh, explain. Thank you, Shironika. We have a, a, um, an hand raised from the audience, so I will leave the micro. I will open the microphone of uh, Barnali Roy, and I don't know how to pronounce your. Uh, uh, oh, here you are. Welcome. Yeah. It is Barnali Roy Chaudhary. Um, thank I'm you from india okay welcome <laughs> thanks thanks very thank you very much for giving this opportunity to share my views on OER in this international platform uh, thank you very much actually i've been working for last 10 uh, years in this uh OER and oep uh, with the help of commonwealth of learning and as well as uh I did a project uh, in association with UNESCO itself uh, to develop a toolkit on open and uh, access and open educational resources. So, and uh, I have published a book on resource optimization that is a fully open access book, which has been published in 2015 from UNESCO House itself. So uh, what is my work and what is my part and contribution towards this open access world is I have already uh, contributed several uh, um, uh, write-ups and uh, my research paper on uh, different aspects, just on uh, open access platform, number one. This is uh, my uh, uh, contribution. Not only that, actually I have created different OER repositories under the umbrella term of uh, Commonwealth of Learning, SEMCA, New Delhi uh, part. That is uh, at uh, Rajashitan and Open University, at uh, uh, Bilashpur University. And uh, then uh, we have our Open University in uh, Rajashitan and Open University, Allahabad, then Bangladesh Open University, Help University, Malaysia, then B.R. Ambedkar Open University, and my university, that is Netaji Shubhash Open University. We have already built up our OER repositories, institutional repositories kind of thing. and. Here, I have actually implemented that is introduction to implementation of OER and OEP because it is a chain uh, of uh, works. Actually, we have to do for, to introduce up to implementation. That is number one uh, capacity building program for teachers first because we are all from higher education institution, you know. Then, uh, so at, at the very first beginning, we have to have the capacity building program for teachers itself, then different kind of sensitization program for the learners. As we are, uh, we are part of open universities, we have lots of learner support centers in different uh, level and even in different marginalized area also. So how to reach the unrich people? This is the only way that is OER can help us in that way to reach the unrich people and to bridging the gap between the information have and have not. So that might be a very helpful uh, area for us. 
and not only that i will what i am proposing to all uh, platform in national and international that whenever we are talking about different kind of educational material it must have the implementation of the meta learning material which is the amalgamation of the text audio video and lots of blogs and the different kind of tweets and all so it must be a referencing kind of thing it is not like the uh, description of the thing which is already exist in the uh, current literature itself so uh, different kind of video materials so it it must be an interactive one with the help of the discussion forum and all and not only this I, I, what i actually intended to do with the work that is optimize optimize uh, use of the existing literature to create Wonderful. and curate a new literature with the help of the OER. And that should be our practice of uh, open educational practices. And in such a way, we have to follow different kind of policy making framework, which includes OER uh, policy framework. Not only that, to support OER policy, we must have the ICT policy for institutional level in, in, in uh, even from the uh, for the uh, national level itself so one kind of mandates i feel very uh, very very much pertinent to this issues so uh, this is so what we actually trying to capitulate that that is not only the introduction and implementation of OER in institutional level or in a small small level we must have the national mandate to implement from top to down until and unless it is really uh, hard to reach uh, what is we are calling as equitable quality education for all. Thank you. Thank That's you. On the, for my, Thank you, myself. Barnale, because I think that uh, uh, the experience uh, you described your experiences and thank you for all the work that you are doing and for the enthusiasm that you bring together with your words. I think that many of the things that you are doing, despite all the differences that are contextual, are in common to all the countries that are progressing. And uh, despite all the difference that we represent in this room today, there are many links that I see in between what you described to different stages of development uh, uh, of op the open education context uh, other, other, in other places, including my country, including Italy. But uh, I'm looking at uh, the eyes of our champions now, because I think that you can uh, tell more about uh, what Barnali shared. But thank you for, for sharing with us. And please add some links to the chat if you want us to yeah. go through some of your resources. Even better if some of them are uh, understandable for ignorant people like me who can read just a few languages and English is one of them. Okay, because it would be great for me to, to go through those resources later. And I'm sure that participants to this Open Education Cafe will be happy to do the same. So thank you, Barnali. Thank you very much. Um, I can join, Paola. Sure, can you hear me? Sure. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I so appreciate all the contributions so far, and you know, I'm, it's it's making me think, you know, even more deeply, um, just about what we're here to discuss. And um, I, there's a growing body of work around critical and social justice approaches and equity focused approaches to open. And these are some just wonderful examples this morning. And I think, you know. Each of us as practitioners, whether we're a librarian or a lecturer or an educational technologist or whatever, it's about being in the rooms that we are doing our work in, whether those are physical or metaphorical, and asking those equity focused questions. So, you know, who is included? Who is excluded? Why? You know, English language has been brought up today, um, different geographical areas, you know, access to connectivity has been mentioned today. There are so many areas of difference and have the humility to be prepared to change plans, to change designs, to change the status quo. And as Camille mentioned, you know, doing that at the policy level is much harder. Um, I shared a UNESCO brief, which gives some, some guidelines for, for how to address that as a policy level, but whatever rooms we are in, we need to be prepared to ask those difficult questions um, because the work is so, so diverse. And, you know, just like it's um, the responsibility of, largely responsibility of white people to challenge racism and, you know, men to challenge sexism. 
um, and, you know, the global north to challenge, you know, global north centrism. Um, it's up to all of us as open education advocates to enact openness in our contexts that are just, you know, to have that concept of what equity is. And let me just continue asking those questions. Um, and redesigning the rooms, redesigning the tables, you know, uh, where decisions and policies and so on are made. And I'll just point before I finish, just, you know, there is this growing body of work, as I said, which is informed by, you know, a, a excellent body of work in social justice, like Nancy Fraser's work about redistributive, recognitive and representational justice. And we really need to aspire to representational justice. In other words, not stopping at just access to OER, but you know, self-determination for people, you know, to speak for themselves in creating OER and open and OEP. So I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. I just want that those are just a few thoughts based on what's been said so far. Tracy, you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry, I started talking, but <laughs> I noticed. Uh, these are very important points Catherine um, is raising there about social justice. Uh, I'm just wondering how can we include these voices that are not here at the moment, that are marginalized or feel that they have no voice even. So any ideas? Open to the audience, to anybody. Sharonika, you seem to be- yeah, I just I just wanted to uh, say something about uh, our teachers, because as I said, uh, most of our, I mean, in Sri Lanka, uh, the, in the schools, most of the schools, they teach in the mother tongue, right? Uh, I mean, the local languages, either Sinhala or Tamil. So even the stories I said, sharing, sometimes they, some teachers, I mean, they were not capable of, I mean, using the English language to write their stories. So, but we wanted them to be published because, uh, to motivate the others and also to give them that uh, sort of empowerment that my story is being shared globally. So they, that so what we did when we worked with them, we had writing workshops. They wrote in their local languages and we translated for them. You know that sort of one-to-one uh, um, -one work and so that that was one supportive thing we did uh, to uh, help with the language issue. Uh, so those are published, uh, the stories are published in English, so that because Singhala is spoken only in my country, uh, so, so to, to reach a wider audience. And then it's published in not only, uh, I mean, they were published in print and electronically as well, uh, so that uh, we distributed the printed books uh, all over the country through the Ministry of Education. We distributed them um, to the libraries of schools and other educational institutions so that it served two purposes. One thing is to uh, give recognition to those teachers who were involved and to motivate the others who are, you know, to also to get involved. So uh, to address the language issue, we help them uh, and they also found their own strategies. So I, I just uh, wanted to share that uh, experience we had with the teachers, school teachers. Thank you. Can I ask a question, Sharonika, about what you just said about the stories? And it's fascinating and very important. Um, and I, I can see that you're using English also for wider dissemination as, as a lingua franca. But I think there are also individuals who may struggle using written language. And uh, do you also consider using or have you used more creative inquiry approaches? I mean, I'm currently teaching on a module called Creative Inquiry, where we use art-based um, sort of communication, yeah. for example to enable these voices to be heard in different ways that otherwise would be perhaps silence. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that actually we used uh, mind mapping and concept mapping poster creations with teachers and students at well during our projects. There were a lot of creative creations happening. Uh, when they understood the concepts, we allowed them to uh, create, uh, you know, either mind maps or in a graphical way, you know. Uh, so, uh, those are also um, part of the stories. They included them as well. Uh, so I think that's one way. And the other thing is we uh, created videos. If you go to the most recent C Delta uh, project, uh, we had uh, video clips. Uh, so those in those videos, they, they were expressing in all three languages. I mean, not only in English, if they find it difficult to uh, express themselves in English, we allow them to uh, express in Sinhala or Tamil. And then we put subtitles uh, for the others to understand. 
so we we did use uh, several strategies uh, to support this uh, multi modal uh, strategies that's wonderful my students just submitted something <laughs> a multimodal <laughs> assignment on sharing their stories thank you okay. yeah i think that uh, about uh, the use of uh, visual images and uh, this is something that i learned from you for example chrissy <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. Uh, in order to support uh, uh, cross the boundaries between different languages can be really helpful, at least at the beginning. Then there are other stages where uh, maybe the in inspiration part or the keywords part is not enough at a certain point. So we have to dive into the explanatory parts. And uh, this requires more skills, more resources, and maybe different formats. But if the link between people is there, then it's easier to work together in order to, to overcome the, the, the boundaries that uh, different languages sometimes build between us. Um, it's part of our intentional work at Spark Europe and also most of all in the, the European network of open educational librarians to focus on uh, different languages as part of our active uh, attempt to uh, be more inclusive, but it's not only that, it's also different formats, being able to uh, come up with formats that are um, simple to, to be adapted, that don't require too many skills uh, by others. And if they have more skills, they are free to make them even more beautiful or more attractive. But uh, first of all, being inclusive means being welcoming for all, maybe. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, choosing formats and choosing uh, uh, different media. Is this helpful to work uh, in open education to be more welcoming? Is it helpful to also to avoid being judgmental somehow? Because if creativity is in the room, uh, it's easier somehow to have a, the, the right approach in being a, in opening arms and being welcoming for all the, the people. I don't know, please tell me. I can show an example and a question to the audience as well. Uh, because uh, I would probably even think about going a step further with the simplification of how we use different formats and how we want to, what, what we want to achieve in the classroom or in the educational situation. So the, the example is that currently, in Poland, as you, you know, we have a situation with uh, Ukrainian students coming because of the war and uh, and Russian intervention and Russian uh, war uh, upon Ukraine, which happens to be a very specific situation in the educational sector. Like Poland and Ukraine had a lot of similarities in how we run K-12 education, but at the same time, we have some differences. And the language is easy enough for understand each other, but of course it's a different language and a different spoken and written, so like we can understand. But in, in, in school, it's a very different situation, of course, if you want to teach and learn the language. Uh, and uh, what, what we found like very difficult and interesting in last, last year that um, students, which is like already like 15% of students in Poland are from Ukraine. Uh, so especially in the, the like K1 to like uh, from age seven to 12, uh, I think, then it drops. But uh, the, the, the interesting part is that we had both open and digital textbooks and curriculum on both sides. So both in Poland and Ukraine. So you, would, you, you might think, okay, it will be easy to combine them or adjust or align in a fast way to, to help those students and help those teachers. Totally the opposite. Uh, so even though we had uh, like open and available and uh, like digital textbooks, digital curriculums, we even had some people who are consulting on both sides. Uh, so knowing the curriculum, we had Polish experts on Ukrainian curriculum and Ukrainian experts on Polish curriculum. So we had experts to talk about to each other about this, even though the problem on, uh, on a daily basis is that those Curriculums, even with all the textbooks available, are not aligned because it's different and it's difficult because it's not only Ukrainian language, it's Ukrainian and Russian language in some parts of Ukraine. So we had all those difficulties. And at the, at the end of the day, what teachers needed 
were not the textbooks, but was like very easy help with the alignment. So it's not solved, solvable by uh, format. It's not solvable by additional resources. Uh, at the end of the day, the only person who could solve that was uh, a real person, not a chatbot, not a, not a textbook, but a person who might help you with aligning to your class, to your situation, to your multicultural situation you have in your class. Do you have like one student or five students? Uh, oh, the, are they speaking one or two languages? Are they speaking Russian or Ukrainian? And only with that help, it was uh, like it was possible for teachers to um, to to use those resources, which I think is uh, uh, is uh, the, the the question I have. Like how we can make resources simple and multilingual, as mentioned on chat, mentioned in previous discussions, but also easy to uh, have consultants, people who will help, like librarians maybe, who can help the teachers, the educators use those resources because openness in, in our case, at least in Poland, was not enough. Like openness and digital uh, availability and dual language uh, availability was not enough. Thank you, Kamil. Uh, I will go back to these uh, uh, later on through the registration because I need to, to think more in depth about what you said in relation to what we are trying to do in many ways. Um, we still have uh, some minutes uh, before we we finish our hour together, uh, but I would really love to ask you now if uh, if there is anything that you see specifically librarians can be helpful uh, for um, a better, uh, diverse, inclusive, and equitable uh, open education offer, uh, both locally and also beyond boundaries, because uh, since they are uh, somehow bringing resources into their libraries and making them available, they can uh, somehow cross uh, boundaries in many ways. So I see them as key players, but I would love to hear from you. We, what would you like to suggest to our librarians in the audience about their active role in order to achieve uh, uh, the results related to action area three of the UNESCO year recommendation? Who wants oh. to start? <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I just uh, welcome. You go, Shionika. Yeah. Yeah, just, just briefly, because um, uh, uh, our librarians are also interested in creating this institutional repository, uh, because I think that's one way they, I mean, that's been done everywhere I believe. But it's not just, I, I was thinking while you were, I, we were talking about all these issues, what we usually do is the repository, we just uh, make the collections of, I mean, that is uh, making content more accessible and uh, facilitate the easy access uh, to others so that categorizing and organizing. And, and But at the same time, you can also make the content more accessible by um, helping people to uh, adapt them. I mean, using the five R's like the revising, remixing, and uh, even translating. I mean, these things, people, sometimes people don't go um, think about those things, but I think librarians can help if, if the librarians can help, maybe the academics uh, or the teachers, I mean, I, I'm talking from the point of view of the university, uh, but even in schools, the librarians are there. So I think the librarians can play a big role in making the content more accessible in different ways, not only uh, by providing access to resources, but also making them in different formats, like we were talking now, uh, like using creative, the you know the same content because of the five hours, people don't realize that you can adapt and make different things out of the existing OER. If it's just text, how to make uh, I don't know just a, a video or a animation uh, or a song or a visual. There are so many ways of expression. So I think librarians can help uh, uh, in making content accessible in different ways that thought just came into me i just wanted to share that thank you thank you <laughs> what about the others um I, I think i'm speaking to the experts of flexibility and humility in this room of of librarians but um those are the words that come back to me all the time and you know one one point i i 
often make in relation to openness is that we can learn a lot from other movements for social change. So like movements for civil rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights. In retrospect, there were victories and advancements in those movements. But if you were involved in any of those movements, workers' rights, anything, at the time, there can be very chaotic and messy, and there can be competing values and competing objectives. So I think that's really useful for us to understand in this moment, because some, like Sharonica says, you know, maybe a repository is something that someone wants to do and someone else wants to focus on, you know, training, someone else wants to focus on the community focus. So finding ways to balance and recognize and acknowledge, you know, all of those efforts, knowing that, you know, success will rely on many different points of action. Um, we know that from historical movements. And I just, uh, this is something I think about a lot. And I just read something this week by um, Andy Sterling, who wrote, wrote just about this, about looking back at social movements and what we can learn. And he just, I saved this quote, he said, whatever kinds of success have been won in these struggles is more often and more deeply due to unruly, pluralistic murmurations, like murmurations of starlings of dissenting understandings and values, direct collective action and horizontal culture change. So, you know, I just bless you all, you, all the librarians who are doing this work in really, you know, challenging circumstances, because I think that is what it takes is this very multi, multi-pronged and, and humble and flexible approach. But so thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah, I, I very much, yes, I very much agree with what has been said already. And Camille said here, uh, multi, ling, multi, I don't know, multi, well, what do you mean there in the chat? Uh, assistance, sort of librarians so, as assistants. So we have this, we have this role from last few years, I think five or six years in Poland, when teachers or librarians or uh, psychologists can become uh, multi, like this is the direct translation. So we call them multicultural assistants and there are assistants to schools mostly, but not like sometimes maybe to a group of school, sometimes to one bigger school. And they are trained to help teachers to like see and understand and work with, with the diverse situation they have. And then with more and more students, uh, coming from different countries, different backgrounds, especially in the last two years uh, because of the war, the role of those ass assistants is extremely important because like they do the connections, as I mentioned, aligning the curriculum of the textbooks, but at the same time, they're making the connections and alignments. Okay, maybe you have to think about the different stress those those kids are coming from, different situations, and how you can adjust your, your, your teaching practice to that because as you've mentioned, it's it's a competing, the, the situation is competing for the teacher's time. So they might need a human interaction, human help to think about how to be more inclusive, how to like diversify the methods, not because just what they were learned, uh, what they learned to do, but because of the new situations they're in. So like how we can like be very agile in making the uh, diversity, equity, inclus inclusion, Agile for teachers, for those practitioners who are really doing this in the classroom. So how 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 we can make this not about the the, the names of the of the values, but how can make me like help them with the practice. Uh, and this is this is very often the role of librarians in Poland. Okay, so thank you for explaining. So link link to that, I would go maybe one step further even because um, beyond assistance, these are partners. They can uh, librarians are very valuable, invaluable. Um, partners and collaborators, I think, in uh, in making open happen in an inclusive, equitable and uh, way. I think that's really important to remember. And we have done that uh, in the Knowledge Equity Network. Librarians are at the heart of the initiatives and from the outset, and they have a voice. So uh, what I would suggest is that uh, there are many, many opportunities for librarians, wherever you are, to work more closely with academic teams, with uh, lecturers, tutors, um, learning technologists, etc., to really embrace uh, and work together in collaboration to make uh, change happen. I think that's the only way if we start, uh, as Catherine said, sort of a more horizontal a way of working together where we uh, get rid of uh, sort of titles and hierarchies and, and levels, etc., and work together. Thank you. Thank you all for your great contribution. I don't know if there are, uh, if there, is there any question from the audience? Uh, because uh, we are reaching the end of this uh, Open Education Cafe, but I would love 
who have uh, uh, questions uh, from uh, participants, if any. And if not, they might uh, come later. And I'm sure that we can facilitate, uh, I can facilitate circulating them in case they, they come up later on. Oh, yes, we have Barnali. Barnali, please go ahead. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, in addition to that, I just want to, uh, as being a pro faculty of library and information science uh, background itself, actually I'm faculty of library and information science department. What is actually our job being a librarian? Our main objective is to cater personalized information to the pertinent people. That is right information to the right people. So in that way, we have a uh, two job. One is uh, knowledge organization and another one is knowledge retrieval. So in case of knowledge organization, we may use different kind of open source based software to promote open access initiative. Because we have uh, open source uh, library management software like um, Koha and a digital repository software like DSpace, GSDL and all. So in that case, we may implement such kind of software to uh, uh, promote open access initiative by using free open source software, number one. And number two is for the organization and uh, retrieval part, what we can do for the retrieval part, we can use different kind of discovery tool. Like one very sophisticated discovery tool is there that is view find. So with the implementation of the view find, we can retrieve even content level information and we may cater our uh, users even. So number one, uh, number two is this. And then after, in spite of having such kind of sophisticated retrieval tool, one, another one retrieval tool on open access uh, fraternity is there, that is ontology, different kind of ontology driven uh, SART service, actually that may create as a retrieval tool, that may uh, use as a retrieval tool for the personalized information. Suppose uh, one of the uh, speaker is Something went wrong. Oh, yes. Software. Now we can hear Ontology you again. Ontology based software. If we have Protigy, Protigy is an open source software which is dedicated for the ontology editor, we can use, even retrieve the personalized information itself for the different community, different kind of uh, uh, person uh, who are actually, suppose in case of transgender, for the medical people, we have different kind of controlled vocabulary, natural language processing software. So in such a way, we can retrieve pertinent data and personalize data for the community driven uh, service even because we the, we are not considering ourselves as a uh, faculty or teacher. We are considering our, ourselves as a facilitator. Even if librarians are also facilitator, if we are giving them the facili uh, facilities with the help of the tools and technology, it would be much more easier to access and to avail those kind of information. Apart from that, with the help of the different kind of meta search engine, we may create one meta search engine, which is available for open access um, uh, platform, different kind of uh, information, that is uh, different kind of sources are there. What we can uh, create, we can create a, a, a meta search engine, even with the help of the Google custom search engine, a dedicated search service for the people who are basically uh, asking for, or in such a way we can uh, create a panel or we can create few services to cater the actual services. This is, uh, this may be happened from the librarian site itself to promote and to cater all year. Thank you, thank you Barnali. Thank you. And uh, again, what you said resonates with many of the discussions that are ongoing also into our European network of open education librarians. Um, I think that one of the keywords from your last contribution uh, in my mind is uh, facilitate. Honestly, uh, it, it's a word that uh, resonates with, uh, and it's cross hierarchical, is not related to any specific role, but uh, maybe it's key for us uh, as an intentional approach 
to toward the uh, learners because that's what we are here for right we are here to help learners every from every country every age um every subject also is fine it's uh, to facilitate and make easier for them to find the, the the best materials and the best approach possible to move forward so thank you all for being with us today uh, all our champions Chrissy, Catherine, Chironica, Camille and Barnali who opened her microphone too thank you for being with us today it's been an interesting uh, open education cafe and it, and it was too fast <laughs> we needed more time maybe next time we, uh, we will discuss for longer hopefully thanks again for being with us and uh, uh, thank for our audience for sharing this part uh, of the day with us. See you soon, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. See you soon. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.